thank you for coming to Google. Uh, yes, we are recording. So I mean, my email address is there. So today we're going to talk about MediaPipe, which is an open source uh, framework for media processing. So I know I'll go into details later. But anyway, I just want to make sure most of all of you guys understand English. Sorry, I don't speak German. <laughs> OK, good. All right. So anyway, if you have questions, and we have a volunteer. Sorry, what's your name? Laura. Yes, Laura has a mic. So just let you know, just raise your hand, and Laura will come by and give you the mic and can ask questions. OK, cool. So without further ado, uh, media pipe. So all right. What do you think all these things have in common? So on the, on the left side, you have uh, face detection and on an Android. And then you have on the iPhone XR, you see this guy is doing his hands. He has, you have multi hands tracking. And then you see on the right, there's this lady with effects on her face running from a web browser. And then you see Nest Cam, right? And then you have YouTube and then you have OK Google. And then on the bottom right, you have a Raspberry Pi or, or you have a Corel Dev uh, HTP. Who is familiar with Google Corel devices? Anyone? It's like Raspberry Pi, but with an ML chip, right? Called HTP for machine learning acceleration. So anyway, what do you, th what do you think all these things have in common? <laughs> very smart, very good. Yes, media pipe, exactly. So all these things have in common uh, is media pipe. So for example, every YouTube video you watch, who watches YouTube? Every video you watch, by the way, is processed with some sort of machine learning model using media pipe. Google doesn't have humans to watch all the videos, right? That's uploaded. So they have machine learning models to view, to watch the video to see if there is, you know, a copyright violation, porn, or something like that on the video itself. So MediaPipe is running. And who has a uh, Nest Cam? Who has any of this Nest Cam? Have you heard of Nest Cam? OK. Who has said the words OK Google on the phone or something like that before? OK, you are probably using MediaPipe, actually, especially if you use Google Home. Who has Google Home? If you say OK Google, actually, there's MediaPipe running on that pipeline. So basically, MediaPipe is that framework, right? It's the open source framework. And when I say cross-platform, what do I mean? Do you, you remember Android, iOS, web, and embedded device on the bottom right? MediaPipe runs on all of these, as well as on the server. YouTube, when they process every video, it's on some cloud server, right? So that's what I mean by cross-platform, runs everywhere. And it's basically a framework for you to build uh, perception pipelines. I will explain what perception pipelines, but basically you can think of it as some sort of video, audio, some sort of time series data that gets processed in some sort of pipeline example. All right. So at Google, uh, we use MediaPipe for two things, right? Uh, the first one is uh, data set preparation for ML training. So what it means is, who is familiar with post estimation? Post estimation? OK, good. You know post estimation is you take a video or image, right? And then you let the machine learning models identify key points of you, correct? So for example, one thing you can do is take all the video, create the key points, and take these key points and let some machine learning model learn these key points uh, for action recognition or something like that. So basically, you take video or time series data, you output some data set some data file, and then take this data file for training. That's what I mean by the first use case. Now, the second use case is more interesting and what we want to spend more time on, which is uh, machine learning inference on device. Right. So remember just now this example of running the face detection on the left, on your face, right, on the phone. That is on device inference. So that is where we're going to spend most of our time here. So here are more examples that are public of how MediaPipe is used. So you know, uh, the first one on the left is a YouTube. 
you can see the lady on the left. You know, she's not watching YouTube and then she's doing using a camera and doing it and looking at the camera. And actually, she's trying out the lipsticks. So what is happening here? You have a machine learning model that is actually looking at the video and every frame and identifying where the lips are. And then it's applying a visualization on the lips, right? You see she's changing color. So there is an AR lipstick effect, right? So that's media pipe as well. And then the second one, you see, right, this uh, Stranger Things AR movie trailer in YouTube. So what's happening? The, late, the, person, the girl, she's watching, she's looking at the camera. And what is happening is the machine learning model is doing background segmentation and cropping just her upper body and replacing the upper body with uh, the Stranger Things background, right? So that is another example of a machine learning model on video. And then there is another example on the top right, this one here. This is lens, living surface. So what it's doing is there is a, your, your camera, you are shooting it on an, a magazine. And once it finds this magazine, this object, it detects it and it tracks it. And then on that object, it replaces it with a moving rendering. So that's what you're seeing, right? It's a book, it's a page out of the, out of the magazine, and it replaces that moving, you see, on, the, on this top right hand here. Right? And so you can see the ladies moving. So this is as well AR. And you know, there is Lens Translate. So you can see the picture here. This is a Chinese ticket but translating in English. So what's actually happening is taking every video frame of the ticket and then tracking the words on that ticket and then replacing it with rendering. And then on the bottom right, you can see uh, what I mentioned to you about, you know, the face effects and stuff. You can see here, we can put glasses on or, you know, overall effects. Again, all these are basically live inference, live on-device inference. So as I mentioned, MediaPipe has been around since 2012. So the version of MediaPipe you see online, you can go to mediapipe.dev. That version is like the great grandson of 2012, the version that was created for YouTube. So MediaPipe was created for YouTube. And then over time, it has evolved, and now we are cross-platform on devices and stuff. And so you can see these are the public uh, examples of uh, use of media pipe. So how many have used a Cloud Vision API or some sort of Cloud API? Does anyone use? Yes. That is running media pipe in the back end. And if you have used uh, Nest Cam, as I mentioned, you know in Nest Cam, they will actually track like a baby or an object moving, that whole tracking perception pipeline behind is actually media pipe as well. Okay, so before I continue, are there any questions before we go into details? Anyone? No question? Okay, cool. So I keep talking about media pipe as, as a framework to create perception pipelines, right? So what is a perception pipeline? So let me give you an example. Say I tell you today, your goal is to track a hand. So basically you can see, right, my hand is moving and then that app, right, you are writing, can basically tell you where are the key points on the hand. 21 key points, you can see 21 key points actually in detail, 21 key points. So how will you do it, you know? Ordinarily, what you would do is, oh, you say, okay, I have an image, I have video, every image in that video, I just apply some sort of machine learning model, and I get the key points, and I'm done. What's so hard about that? Is that all? Actually, no, there's more to it. So, this is the pipeline, right, if you were to do it. So, what does that mean? You have the video at the top. Every video input, you have a frame, right? And in a video, you have a frame uh, with a timestamp. 
right? Every milliseconds or something, you have one image frame, depending on how fast the camera is running. And every frame comes into this pipeline. So what do you need to do? You need to take that image. You need to try and pre-process it to make it smaller because most of the machine learning models will only take maybe 128 by 128 or 256 by 256 size tensor. So who, who is familiar with uh, machine learning models here? Anyone? OK, good. So you know, right, who uses, actually, let me take a survey. How many people use uh, TensorFlow here? OK, how many use PyTorch? OK, how many use both? OK, so you guys know, regardless of whether it's PyTorch or TensorFlow, you, the model needs to take some sort of tensor, right, coming in. And it outputs some sort of tensor. So the image that we have taken needs to be transformed to be smaller because if the model is 256 by 256, the normal image that you have is 640 by something, some, some amount, 256. It's too big. So you need to, pre, to resize it. And then you need to take that resized image and transform it into a tensor. And then at this step, tensor, you put it into this uh, inference model, and this inference model will take the, the tensor and give you the result, which is another tensor. Now you need to do post processing, right? Because remember, what do we have here? We have key points rendered on the video itself, right? So you have to take the tensor and give you that. So how do you do that? You take the output tensor, you take the tensor and you output it as landmark points result. This landmark result will then come into this renderer and output the video with the drawings like you see here. So this whole pipeline is essentially media pipe. So this whole thing you see here in the Dot, dotted line, dotted line is a graph. And in each graph, there are nodes. And each node is a calculator, right? It's a media pipe calculator. So between two nodes, you see this line here? It's a stream. And in the stream, you can think of it like a pipe, right? Where water is flowing, right? So in the same case, each video or each image frame can be represented as a packet. So instead of flowing water in a pipe, you can flow packet of data. So each packet is a timestamp with some sort of binary object, right? So you can represent, as long as you can represent in media pipe any data, so which means it can be audio too, right? Timestamp with a uh, binary packet of binary object of uh, audio stream. Or it could be uh, LiDAR data. Or it could be radar data. It could be image, right? So each packet goes into this graph. And into this graph, it goes to each of these nodes, which are calculators. And each of the calculators are doing the computation. And this graph is continuously running all the time until you tell the graph not to run anymore or has completed its work. So that is media pipe. All right, before I proceed, is everybody still with me? Okay, good. Any questions? Please feel free. Yes. Actually, before you ask, yeah, can you take the mic? You have to press, is it? Uh, you have to press the button. Turn no. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to know, is everything uh, there just running on the device or there are some nodes uh, running on server? Or, for example, when I, when I see the model inference part, is this model an update in the now and then in case it's running on the device or how is it? So each of this graph is running on a single machine, or in this case, a device. So you can have this pipeline, the whole thing, run on a, on a cloud but you can also have it run on the phone. 
you don't have it distributed, no. So MediaPipe right now is a single machine framework. So which means if you have this graph, everything you see here is on a single machine or device. Thank you. So on, okay. Um, I'm wondering, is this, is this cyclic? As in, it, probably if I want to like track posture from image to image, what I what I the posture that I know from the last image is going to be useful for the future image as well, right? You're probably not running it on every single image. Yes. So, so very smart. Feedback. We'll we'll get to that later. Okay. It's coming. Okay. Baby steps. We we you know we take you to crawl and then you will walk and then you will fly. All right, coming. Okay. So very good. So let's talk about the key concept here: calculator, right? Remember, I told you every single node in the graph is a calculator, right? That does the computation. So the key concept here is the calculator, the media pipe calculator. So the media pipe calculator is written in C++. And what it means is, let's take an example here. The first one, image transform calculator. It has input and output ports for each calculator. So in this case, what is the input? Port here. Can someone tell me? Image. It takes an image. And what do you think is the output port here? It's also an image. Exactly, jackpot. And it's a transformed image, right? You take an image in, you resize it, make it smaller or whatever you want to do, and then it comes out another image. So that's what the calculator does. And each calculator has to implement four methods, but that's for your purpose right now, just three methods, which is open, process, and close. What does open? Open means when the graph is running, right, and activate each calculator, it will run the first open method. And then every packet that goes into the graph, remember every image that keeps going from a video into the graph, it will call that calculator repeatedly, process. So process is called every time you have a packet that enters the calculator. So for example, in this case, image one enters this calculator image transform, it will call the process once. Image two enters this image transform calculator again, it will call the process again. Image three enter again, right? So you just keep going, process, calls the process repeatedly. And then after the packet goes through this graph and finishes, right, and then the whole graph is closed, then you'll call the last call called close for each of the calculators. So that's basically the key concept of media pipe calculator. So in the open source framework, uh, we have open source, all the calculators are not uh, a large number. I think we open source about 80 different calculators. And in these 80, there are some calculators for image and media processing. And then we have, in this case right now, uh, native support for TF Lite, TensorFlow, and TensorFlow Lite. So remember here, you are running a machine learning inference, right? So each time you want to take an input tensor, and run it on, say, PyTorch, or run it on TensorFlow, in this case, or TensorFlow Lite, you need to call this inference calculator. So we have this already written, open source. So every if you have a TensorFlow Lite model, it's ready to go. And then, as I mentioned, we also have some post-processing calculators for some common ML tasks, for example, like object detection, tracking, segmentation, so these examples you can see in our open source website. And then we have some general utility calculators that does flow, which we will talk about, and does annotation, you know, just the drawing. You see the drawing here, this drawing lines and points. Yeah, we have utility calculators for that. Okay, so one of the key thing, if there's anything I want you to walk away from this talk today is Media pipe is a framework for processing time series data, right? Time series data means timestamp of 
something, right? So when you have timestamp, so for example, at t equal to zero, you have the first image come in, right? And t equal to 10 milliseconds, a second image comes in. Now you have a lot of this image keep going into this pipeline. You need to synchronize such that you know which packet goes in first, which packet goes in later, then which packet comes. And if you have two packets that goes in at the same time with the same timestamp, you want to wait for two packets to be ready to process because they are the same timestamp. So all these synchronization of timestamp, the whole framework takes care of it for you. Right? That's why when you take the video, it is in sequence, makes sense, and not jumble. Right? All right. Remember just now in the first uh, graph I showed you, we have how many calculators is it here? Can someone tell me how many calculators in the first here? One, two, three, four, five, correct? Now, what if I tell you you can represent this one, two, three, four calculators as a subgraph, which is another calculator? So you can take this and it becomes hand landmark because remember just now in the example i told you it takes an image it takes an image it transforms the image it converts into a tensor it puts it into the tf light inference calculator you come out with the result which is from tensor to landmarks and then you take each of the landmark and then you render it on the screen right the 21 key points so what this whole pipeline or this four calculators does it just takes an image and gives you a landmark, uh, landmarks of the hand. This thing is a subgraph. And then this uh, also can be another subgraph called render. Right? So why do we have subgraphs? It's because imagine I can then take this hand landmark and use it in another graph. It's like a module. That's the concept of subgraph. You can take it like blocks, right? Module, like Lego blocks too. I take one hand landmark subgraph, I take something else, and then I put it together, and I have another new graph. So you can, like kids, you know, playing Lego, you can take different groups of calculators together and put them together. All right. Now, can someone tell me what is the issue with this graph, right? Whereby, remember, our problem was to take a video and then give you the hand landmarks. What do you think is one of the key problems you will face with creating, you're trying to create a machine learning model for this? Actually, the answers are written there. I'll, I'll just tell you. So one of the problem is a hand can appear anywhere in the image, right? So imagine this is the image right here. My hand can be here, my hand can be here, my hand can be here. So the whole model can be seen just this, or can be seen half, or can be seen the whole thing, right? Can be seen different parts. And you can see a Asian hand, you can see a German hand, you can see, you know, a woman's hand, or see a African's hand, you know, all different colors. And so if you want to create a machine learning model to identify just the hand landmarks when you have so many variations, that model will be very uh, need a lot of weights, right, to remember and recognize. That means the model capacity is very big. And if you train such a model, it's likely to be slow. But you want to run fast on this, right? So how do we break this problem down? We break this problem by first detecting the hand first. Now, doesn't matter is it an Asian hand or German hand or African hand or woman's hand or man's hand, most of our hands have commonality, the palm. It's pretty much like this, right? It doesn't matter you have five fingers, three fingers, two fingers, your palm looks the same, right? Squarish, like what you see here in the green box. So you go identify that first. You go palm detect that first in an image, right? Because once you detect where the palm is, then guess what? You can expand and crop just this part. And then just take this image, give it to the 
hand landmark calculator, and what do you get? Hand landmarks, voila, right? So this new pipeline we have here, it says that I detect the palm first, I take the crop, which is rec, right? Represented by this R-E-C-T of the palm, and I take it into the hand landmark calculator and I give you the hand landmarks. And I take the hand landmarks and I then render it, giving you this, right? So that is the first part of our solution. But can someone still tell me what is a potential problem here? Is that, that's, yeah, that's another model. But actually, the gentleman gave the answer just now a little bit is that the palm detection is still likely to be slow. So because, remember, right, it wants to detect the palm in all parts of the image. It needs to, it's, it's actually likely to be a heavy model. So what we need to do is we don't run this palm detection on every frame, right? If it's slow, you don't run it at every frame. If it's fast, you can run it on every frame. So that's why you see here, the palm detection is actually not run on every frame. Only the hand landmark is run on every frame. So how can we, how can we, uh, so what can happen? As I mentioned, right, the way it is, is imagine this image you have here. Is there a hand in this image? No, right? Now, suddenly, I put my palm into this image, right? Then what happens? It detects, oh, there's a palm here. And then it takes the palm, crops it, and gives it to the hand landmark, and the hand landmark is running. Now, the next moment, I take my palm away from the image. Is there an image? Nothing, right? But imagine, one more second later, I come here now. Now, at this moment, it can you remember that there was a palm here one second ago, but now there's no palm here. There's a new palm because it detects the palm. So it tells it that, oh, you need to do one more detection. So it will only run when there is a palm, basically. So you only run it uh, only when the model knows there's a palm and then it will run the palm detection model, crop it, and then send it to the hand landmark. So this whole details here, I, I won't go into the details of explaining. You can go take a look at example. But basically what it happens is the faster model of the hand landmark is running every frame, but the palm detection is only running when the palm is detected or needed to be detected. And all these things you see here, the delay, the gate, the marks, it's all about flow control, whereby it remembers saying that, remember the image is here, no palm, now there is a palm, it crops it, it remembers the landmark points here, then the next moment I move my palm here, it will know that there was a palm here, and take the result of that previous one and puts it back into the, into the graph. So you can see here, there is a loop back. If there's a presence of a palm, it puts it back here, and then it goes through this gate and comes out and says, oh, you need to do palm detection. So this whole loop and control is when the palm detection is needed to be run. Any questions? So anyway, all you need to really know is that the two models we have broken the problem into two models, one running the hand palm detection when it's needed, and one running the hand landmarks, which is the faster model every time. Oh, okay. Now remember I was telling you the, uh, the hand detection, hand landmarks. So you can see the red box here is hand detection, and the red box here is hand landmarks. These are two set graphs. And with all these building blocks, you can create the multi-hand tracking. Now you can track multiple hands on the right, right? So this 
multiple hands is basically uh, built using these two hand subgraphs. And if you think about what, if you look at this thing, what do you see? How many models are there? How many machine learning models are here? One, two, three, two. Let me ask you, today, how many models do you normally have in most of TensorFlow or PyTorch? You're running one model. So MediaPipe actually, with this whole graph framework, allows you to run multiple models now. And in some cases, I've seen a graph as complicated as 10 models running in coordination and in sequence. So the beauty of MediaPipe, it allows you, is a graph-based framework that allows you to process time series data in a graph with using multiple models. So you can put multiple models in the graph, right? And then run it, basically, on device and on the web. And I want you to remember this particular, remember this particular image I showed you in the beginning on the left? Sorry, slow, slow. Okay, on the left, this is face detection on the Android, on the Android device, right? Now I'm gonna show you today, what if we want to do this on the web today? So this, the graph that you saw for the Android device, this is the same face detection graph you see here. And this is what we call the proto text that defines each of these calculators in the graph. Now I can run this in the graph, in the browser, and you can see my face. So remember, the, just now I was showing you the same graph was running on Android device. Now it's running on the web browser using WebAssembly. So again, I want to emphasize, right, cross-platform. So now you can create a graph with your machine learning models running on multiple devices, right? Across web, Android, iOS, edge devices, even web. And in fact, if you are interested in more details on the hand tracking, you can actually read. We have published an AI Google AI blog post on the 19th of August. You can take a look this year uh, on basically uh, MediaPipe, right? It's a Google AI blog post. It will have details of the model train, and then it will give you links to the open source example. Now, remember how many have done you know, app development, right? Imagine you want to run the app that does all these hand landmarks on iOS, on Android. One of the biggest issues you will face is you will want to use different accelerators. For example, on the phone, you can do the GPU, mobile GPU. So MediaPipe helps you with performance optimization. So if you have on the Android device, for example, and you have OpenGL for GPU, we can have the model and the rendering run on the GPU. So this is taken care of by the framework. You don't have to worry about it. So we can run parts of the graph on the GPU. We can run the parts that cannot run on the GPU, on the CPU, and we take care of all these things for you. But remember, just now, this is hand detection, right? Observe these two boxes. This is hand detection, right? You can actually take the same graph and use for face detection and face tracking, like you can see here, like this guy's face. It's the same graph, except that we swap out. Instead of detecting the palm, we detect the face. And instead detect doing the hand landmarks, we do the face landmarks. So, but it's the same graph. Just swap out some uh, calculators, right? So you notice the modularity of this. Now, what if you want to go beyond the hand landmark, right? You want to say, oh, if I have this is one, if I have this is two, if I have this is three, right? So you can put the calculators here that takes in the input, the landmarks, and gives you gesture classification, right? 
So this calculator is called gesture recognition. So you can actually do that. And what if you want to get fancy, right? Like this guy, right? You want to render beautiful effects every time it comes out, right? Then instead of the ugly renderer you saw here, you can change the calculator to the awesome renderer, right? And then, so again, my whole point of showing you this is the calculator, the, the node modularity, right? Allows you to change the calculators in the graphs and then you, have, you can have different stuff. Okay, let me stop for the moment. How many people are still with me? Okay, very good. Any questions? Maybe we break for one more question before we go to the next part. Any questions? Yes, uh, yeah. Yes. How do you deal with failures, resilience in the pipes? What do you mean scalar? As in no, like if some of the calculators fails and so on, and is the pipeline resilient enough to continue? To yeah, so we take care of that. So if uh, actually, first of all, it's likely that the calculator won't fail. It's the packets that are either taking too much time in a particular calculator, or so-called stuck in a calculator and are slower or delayed or something like that. So our framework will take care of it by looking at the timestamp. Remember the timestamps? So you have two packets. Imagine you have two packets. This is one calculator. You have two packets coming in, right? Uh, actually, if you have two packets, this is calculator, if you have two packets coming in, one is both have the same timestamp, then what will happen is if the first timestamp, the first packet goes into this calculator, it will wait for the next one with the same timestamp to be in the, in the calculator before it does the processing. So this is synchronization, right? You have two packets of the same timestamp, we will process it at the same time. If you, this packet is first, this packet is slower, later, we will process this first and this, then this. So the whole framework takes care of you, all the synchronization. Yes, so if the timestamp, uh, that's called a failure timeout of each packet, you can set something. So answer is, if it's too taking too long, yes, we'll just drop the packet and then wait for the next one to come in. So the framework will take care of that. Uh, oh. um, you said the calculators won't fail, but uh, what if we implement our own custom calculator? What happens then? Is it possible? I mean, how hard is it to implement a custom calculator? Let me be clear. When I say won't fail, I meant that if the calculator is written correctly and you have the right inputs and outputs, it will almost, almost certainly run. However, if you have a bug in the calculator, now I wouldn't call that fail. I call that human error, right? Then the calculator will just not run and the graph will not run. The calculator, all the inputs, outputs have to match. Because this is all C++, there's static typing. You all have to match before the calculator is run. In the case that the calculator has a human error, it wouldn't even, the graph wouldn't run at all. So at runtime, the whole, the graph will check all the calculators and make sure the packets that are going in are the same, the right type, so that everything can run. Um, how, how long is the actual runtime of like one go of this? I'm thinking if you do real time video and you have like 50 frames per second, so that gives you like 20 milliseconds per, per go, right? What's the actual runtime? So it really depends on your model, how fast your model, right, can go. So if your model can only run, say, 100 milliseconds, then your frame rate will not be faster than 10 frames per second. Can you give an example of these? So, for example, this thing that you saw uh, just now, actually, I gave you an example, actually, here, this one. Oh, it says the, the face, the face, this is the face detector, the blaze face detector. We train this model for human faces. It's very fast. You can see it's 
Yeah. Seconds. But it varies. It varies. Sometimes you can see. It's Roughly, you can think, you can look at it as, as like 30 plus frames per second. Does it allow multi processing? Like, can you, can you do multi processing? Like, can you consecutive images in different, like at the same time, but then put them in the queue again? Uh, in this case, MediaPipe, we support multi process, multi tracks. So, if your processor can process multi tracks, the answer is yes. We can optimize and parallel the packets. So, for example, if you have five packets coming into the calculator, and you only have you have five tracks, then these five calculate these five packets each will go to a track to be processed, right? But if your processor can only have one track, and you have five packets with the same time step time stamp, then guess what? It will have to be processed sequentially, sequentially, because you can only run one track at a time. All right, let me go. Oh, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Calculators that work with the GPU, are they like some sort of special calculators? What if I want to plug another inference framework instead of TensorFlow? Do you take care of uploading to the GPU as well, all these things? Sorry, can you repeat the question so again? So these GPU calculators, they use TensorFlow. Can I, can I swap TensorFlow with another inference framework? Yeah, you can. Do right you, now, like, yes, you can. Would it be hard? Like, do you do some sort of special operation here to get TensorFlow to be compatible? Uh, like for example, uploading to the GPU. You say you were doing pro, uh, resource management on the GPU. How does that happen? So first, to be clear, right? When I say GPU, is on, if you have a device that supports the GPU, then the calculator has to be returned to, for GPU. But for most of the time, CPU, the calculators will run by default on CPU. Only when you have GPU shader code you want to run, then the calculator has to have the shader code for running on a GPU. So you do still need to write two sets of calculator, one CPU and one GPU. But the GPU is the shader code, basically. Now, about the inference, here, as I mentioned, we support TensorFlow natively. So we've written those calculators for TensorFlow and TensorFlow Lite already. So you have a TensorFlow Lite model, you're ready to go. However, because this is an open source project, and if there's any brilliant guy here writing C++, you are welcome to support PyTorch. We accept contributions. It's just that we haven't done it. OK, I want to go to the toolkit. Now, MediaPipe toolkit, what does it mean, the whole stack? So let me explain the stack. So as I mentioned, at the most bottom, MediaPipe, the whole framework is written in C++. TensorFlow actually is also C++. It's just that most developers are using the Python APIs to interact with the C++ framework. Similarly, in MediaPipe, the core framework, right, is C++. Our dependencies, the libraries that we depend on are like TensorFlow and OpenCV. So remember the GPU stuff? So if you are on Android, we support OpenGL ES 3.1 and above. And on iOS, you can have metal, right? You just have to write the calculator yourself for, for your application. And uh, on top of this core framework, we have three uh, modules. One is the graph execution API. The graph execution API simply means I define a graph and I run the graph, the API to run the graph. Now, in this case, it's OK that you don't know C++ as long as you know how to define the graph. You can use on Android the Java API to call a graph to run. So if you know how to write Java for Android, you should be fine. And if you are writing Objective C, C you know, for iOS, you can also do the same. So we support C++, Java, and Objective C for the graph execution API. Uh, the graph construction API, remember I was showing you just now. This is the Proto, this is the graph construction API. You see on the on the right here is just text. This is proto text, proto buff text, basically, right? So in this case, this is a very simple graph. You have input, output. One calculator only is called a placeholder calculator. With the in, so this is the graph construction. API being called. 
and is using the protobuf. And then we have the calculator API, which is in C++. And as part of the open source, we have examples, right? And I'll show you some of the examples that we have available. So these are the examples we have available, open source, hand tracking, hair segmentation, face detection, and then we have object detection and tracking now. So this morning, we just released uh, uh, the object detection and tracking. So let me show you an example. So you can see here. Remember object detection on the left? So you can see the glass. Every frame, you run the object detection model on every frame. And you notice on the left, sometimes the the cup is detected, sometimes the cup is not, right? Because of uh, lighting and different aspects. That's why you see, if you move in and out, sometimes it detects, sometimes it doesn't. But we have an uh, object detection and tracking example now. You see on the right, this is the tracking comes in. As long as you have detected once, it will track that box. So you can see when you move in and out, the red cup is continuously tracked and each of the bananas is given an ID. You can see ID 4 and ID 10, right? So you can track. So all these examples we have already open sourced and uh, it's available for you to use, customize, and learn. And we have documentation page. So the web, you should just go to mediapipe.dev. Documentation is there. And then just now I show you the visualizer is to help you visualize the graph that you want to create. So all these are available. And uh, this is our MediaPipe website. And if you want to follow us on new stuff that we are continuously pushing out, you can check out us, us on the Google's developer blog here. And then if you want to reach out to me, I'm on Twitter. So thank you. All right, we have, uh, we have a few more minutes for questions. Anyone have any more questions? Regarding the development environments, is this only the website that you showed you know, where you can develop the pipeline or you can use some local development environments? You can so if you write the C++ calculator, is whatever your development ID that you want to use. So some people use Visual Code Studio right, to write C++ code. If you are using, you want to write the Java uh, Android app, you can use the Android Studio. We support taking the media pipe library in as an AAR file, then you can develop inside the Android Studio if you're writing it. Yeah. It's as if you have already the pipeline ready. The pipeline, yes, you have to define it. in. And as, as I mentioned to you just now, the pipeline is defined using the proto text, right? This is a text. Basically, a proto text file. To I wonder what would be the workflow for a developer let's say building mobile app with a media pipeline. So he needs to go back and forth between his studio and his so environment. So the, the, the way I would do it is I would look at the examples we have and see which one is the closest to what you're trying to do and take that example and then you can modify it, right? You can, for example, if this is a graph for face detection and you want to do face detection, then you can copy this graph. And then in the case that you want to run and compile on whether it's iOS or Android, we have instructions on how you can compile. It's using Bezel, but if you want to do it inside the IDE, then you have to package the graph and all the calculators as a library into an AR file into Android. So there are some complexity, but we have documented some of them on the website. So you should check it out. I think there was a gentleman here, a question. So in terms of applying this, uh, for the last August, I think you uh, you launched an algorithm that uh, is detecting and uh, translating, let's say, sign language. How far are you with that? Oh, you mean sign language? Sign language. Oh, OK. Uh, it's very hard, actually. I don't know if you know sign language. I, I, I don't know Greek that. One. Sorry? I'm Greek, so I studied Greek sign language. But oh, you, you study sign language? Yeah. 
it's very hard because actually, for example, like, you know, for example, I love, I love you, right? Notice my hand is pointing at two places, right? Myself, him. So that video, that image, the model has to know what does this mean? What this means? Or this, or, you know, so, so this whole context is actually hard. And just doing static gestures is easy, right? Like this, five is easy, right? Just one image, you know, is five. There's no, there's no doing this, right? So actually sign language and doing it fast. And just now, I love you is very slow. Some of the, I've seen videos of people, it's like, eh, eh, eh. it's very fast. So, so and, and apparently I didn't know this, but there is German sign language, there's American sign language. I thought they were the same, but apparently not. I actually taught sign language all the is the same, but actually not. They are like as many sign languages as there's many people, types of people. So anyway, this complicates things as well, right? Different gestures meaning different things. So the answer to you is we are very far away from sign language right now. So good to you, you announced something. We only announced just if, if you read carefully, is the press kind of over speculated. We only demonstrated the hand marks and static gestures. We didn't, we didn't say that we will get to sign language. We are working on it, but it's a hard problem, actually. Yes, I think, can you pass the mic to me? Thank you. I'm also how, what will be the challenges of also combining video and audio? Like, for example, to reinforce object detection or if a car is passing by, so face detection would be also bad. So in this object detection example you see here, right? This is uh, totally just an image base, right? There's no audio here. Now, for example, if you want to, I don't know, detect the human face with sound, then you have to have not only the image going to this pipeline, but you have to have another pipeline for audio and you have to process, you have to split the image into an image, the video into an image and the audio packet, right? And then process through two pipelines. We currently don't have audio examples yet. We're working on it. You should see something next, early next year. So, well, I mean, it is possible, yes. So remember I mentioned to you that very first slide, right? Okay, Google. Yeah, within Google, we use Every time you say, okay, Google to the Google Home device, it's actually running media pipe, audio pipeline. A calculator that takes the audio uh, frame and then analyzes it and tells you what it is. Right? So, yes, it's so you can use. also recognize who's saying, for example. No? Okay. Uh, it's possible, but the pipeline will be quite complicated. All right. Oh, one last question, and then we'll close. Uh, can you? I wanted to ask if there are examples of how you could use this in a web application with WebRTC, for example. Sorry? How you could use this in a web application that has a feed from a WebRTC uh, video stream or audio stream? Uh, you could use this in the case of, uh, of uh, video, like this case, right? You can, you know, live streaming, you use WebRTC for live streaming. so. The person can be using his fingers and doing puppeteering or something like that, right? So that you can run each of the web RTC frame stream through media pipe to detect hands and also faces. And you know, in China, one one app they could do is you know on this uh, face right here, you can I know you can make my face slimmer, real time, right? So imagine I'm moving my face like that, you know, instead of you seeing the chubby face, you can make it wider, make it cleaner, make it more handsome, whatever. So that's an, an example application. So there are examples of how you could use this in JavaScript, not Java or... Unfortunately, right now, you do have to use WebAssembly and C++. We don't have JavaScript yet, but uh, you can use WebAssembly. Cool. Thank you. I'm uh, over time. And thanks for coming.